Hello and welcome to part two of this series of lectures on system software. Today we're going to look at the kernel and we're going to look at user interfaces. So what is the kernel? Well, if you have a look right here in the center, you can make out that the kernel is the core of an operating system. Sometimes it's known as the supervisor program, and that's quite an accurate description. The kernel is the part of the operating system that is always resident in your memory, and it calls the other parts of the operating system in and loads them into memory as required. It takes care of all the low-level hardware operations and helps manage all your system resources. So it's really the core, the kernel, of your operating system. And the reason we're mentioning this just now is because it ties in with the user interface. Because one of the functions of the kernel is to provide and manage this user interface for the user. So what is a user interface? Well, I'm sure you know what it is, but it's always good to start with a little definition. So a user interface is the means by which a user can interact and exchange information with the computer. So it's how we interact, it's how we communicate with the computer, it's the look and the feel of this system, and that doesn't matter if you're dealing with your tablet, your smartphone, your laptop, or even your desktop system. You need a user interface, you need a way of giving commands to the computer, and you need a way for the computer to tell you what's going on. So a little note before we continue, while with some operating systems, the user interface is very much tied to the operating system, as in something like Windows, where you're always going to get the same look and feel, because the user interface is separate from the kernel, some operating systems allow you to run a variety of user interfaces on top of the kernel. So for example, Linux, one of the operating systems we looked at before, you can have a wide variety of user interfaces. So there's a particular fork or version of Linux called Ubuntu, and here we can see two different user interfaces. We've got the GNOME 2 interface here, and we've got the KD interface over here, and you can see one is very much like Mac OS, and the other is very much like Windows. So if you're running Linux, you can change the graphical user interface, change the style. It's the same operating system, the same functionality, but how you interact with the computer changes. So the look and the feel is different. So when we talk about user interfaces, there are three main types of interface you need to know about. We've got the command line interface, often just referred to as the CLI. We've got the menu-based interface, and we've got the graphical user interface, often referred to as the GUI or GUI. And I always like that word GUI. It's a lot of fun to say. So that's probably how I'll refer to it. So let's start with the command line interface. So older interface, so older operating systems, for example, MS-DOS, the uh, predecessor to Microsoft Windows, were called command line interfaces or CLIs. And these are text-based. So the idea here is you have to type in the command. And if it's a command that the computer will understand, it carries out the command that you've typed in. So for a long time, this was the only way that you had of interacting with the computer. You had to type in commands, and then the computer would act on those. So up until the mid-1980s, this was the only way of interacting with your computer. This was the prime graph sorry, the prime user interface. And this made computers quite difficult to use because you had to be quite good at programming, learning commands and typing commands in order to be able to interact with your computer. So you can see there's a quite simple example here. We're just copying the letter dot doc file from the C drive to the D drive. So we have to remember it's the copy command. We have to have the path, the name of the document and the path that we're copying it to. So you can see there's quite a lot to remember there. It's not easy just dragging or dropping in a modern operating system. Command line interfaces, CLIs, are very efficient. Because you're only having this text interface, they don't use up a lot of system resources. You, they don't use up a lot of memory or storage space or CPU time. If you know the commands, if you memorize them, it's very fast. 
Uh, if you've ever watched a hacker in a Hollywood movie typing in commands really quickly into a CLI in order to hack into the Pentagon, you probably get some kind of idea what we're talking about. However, the big problem is they're not intuitive. They're very difficult to learn. If you're not a computer expert, they're very puzzling. You're not going to naturally know what all these commands are. You have to sit down, learn them, memorize them, and type them in accurately. And again, the commands have to be typed. If you're not a good typer or if you have some kind of disability, they're not a good system to use. And there are lots and lots of commands. Even expert users aren't going to know every command. There are times you're going to have to look things up. And that's really going to slow down your processing. So again, here's another example of a graph of a command line interface here. They're often favored by programmers and network engineers because a command line interface is fast, it's powerful, and it has a lack of safeguarding limitations. What do I mean by a lack of safeguarding limitations? Well, it means that when you do something like delete your hard disk or another potentially really important command that could really disrupt what's happening, it's not going to ask you if you are sure, yes or no, like on a modern graphical interface. If you type in the command, it's just going to do it. So if you say format hard disk, it's just going to format your hard disk. You can't go, oh, wait, I, that's a silly thing to do. I need to change my... It's, it's too late. But if you're an expert user, if you're a network engineer or you're an administrator on a system, that's brilliant because you can do everything really fast and powerfully. Command line interfaces are also useful for automating processes together using scripts. So you can put a series of commands together in one text file and then just run them all at once. So things like setting up new computers, setting up new users, granting access permissions. You can put it all together in a text file and run many, many commands one after the other just by loading it in at once. The next type of user interface we need to know about is the menu-based inter interface, and there's a couple of examples here on screen. This lets you interact with the computer or a device by working your way through a series of menus, a series of screens. Think about an iPod or a non-smart old-fashioned mobile phone. They both use this menu-driven interface. You're presented with a menu, you make your choice, and the next menu appears. Also things like uh, ATMs, public information systems, these are all good examples of a menu-driven interface. Menu-based interfaces can also be verbal rather than visual. Have you ever made a telephone call and been asked to press 1 for this, 2 for this, or 3 for something else? That is still a menu-based interface, even though it's spoken rather than on a computer screen. So why do we use menu-based interfaces? Well, they are very simple for non-computer users to operate. Anybody can use a menu, they can press a button, they can get to the next screen. There's a limited range of options, so you don't have to worry about the user entering input that is incorrect or invalid because they can only choose the options that you've set for them. However, this is also a disadvantage because it limits how the user can interact with the system. So they are more simplistic, but quite user friendly. All right, now we're looking at the GUI, the graphical user interface. These are very common. These are the prime way that we use computers and we have done since the mid 1980s. So we've got examples here. We've got Windows, we've got a Mac system, we've got iOS, we've got a form of Linux. These are all using GUIs, graphical user interfaces. So again, Windows, Mac OS, Ubuntu all have graphical user interfaces. Android, iOS, these are also GUIs. So why do we use them? Well, they're very intuitive. GUIs are very easy to learn, especially on a touchscreen device. They're visually very attractive. You can have lots of colors, pretty pictures. They can look great. They're interactive. You drag and drop things. You click on things or touch things. And that's a much more natural way of interacting with a computer rather than typing in commands. And that makes them very suitable for non-computer experts. After um, Apple launched the first 
graphical user interface in 1984 for the Apple Mac, this is when computers really took off as a home system. Before we had to use CLIs, which are really difficult to learn, but as soon as you had a graphical user interface with your Apple Mac or later with Microsoft Windows on PC, this made sure that lots of different people could use a computer easily without having to be an expert user. However, they do require more system resources. That's not really a problem in this day and age, but a few, even a few years ago, this extra graphical overhead, this need for extra CPU cycles for extra memory was a downside for GUIs. So while we're looking at graphical user interfaces, we need to know about WIMP. WIMP stands for Windows Icon Menus and Pointer. Sometimes you'll see the M stands for mouse instead of menu. Either form is fine. Just remember that an icon is an image used to represent resources, files, programs, and actions. So these are a couple of examples here, just a couple of icons on a desktop. And this is just a common way that a lot of graphical user interfaces use to represent files and programs and things like that. So most modern operating systems for laptops and desktop use a full WIMP interface. So we can see an example here. You've got your menus, you've got your mouse, you've got your pointers, you've got icons, you've got windows. Just the kind of, if you're using Mac OS or you're using any form of Microsoft Windows, it's the type of system that you'll be very familiar with. However, if we're looking at mobile devices, they don't usually have a full WIMP interface. Instead, they use a GUI based on icons. So again, we've got a couple of examples here for Google's Android system. And you can see there's just a lot of icons there that we can select. So while the use of icons makes them very user friendly, very intuitive, I'm sure we've all seen very young children using an iPad or something similar it does limit the scope for the customization of actions that can be performed. So obviously on a small screen, you can't have a full WIMP interface with all the menus and the pointers and the menus and all the drop downs. However, by getting rid of those, you simplify the operating system. And that means it's more difficult maybe to perform advanced commands than you could on a full WIMP interface. Another one that you should be aware of is what we call voice input or voice recognition or natural language. This is a much more kind of modern way of interacting with the computer, uh, very much like you would see people interacting with computers in old science fiction movies like the original Star Trek series. Voice, rec technology, voice recognition technology has improved significantly in recent years and in many mobile devices provide voice input facilities to be able to decipher simple commands and provide suitable responses. So there's lots of examples about today. We've got Siri, Cortana, Alexa, Google Assistant. I think Samsung has got one called Bigsby as well. They're also used quite commonly in call centers. If you call a call center, you will often speak your password or your input, your, your choice, and you'll just speak it and it'll recognize it and move on to the next menu option. So it's all very similar. So you can use something like Siri to answer simple questions like where is the nearest post office or what is the weather like today? They can take notes, they can record events in a diary, remind you about things that are happening later. So this is, of course, very intuitive and easy to use. It's just like, hopefully, just like talking to a person, you'll get a response, it'll perform the action that you want. However, it's still not fully reliable. While the system and the technology is a lot better than it was even a few years ago, it's still developing. It doesn't get everything right first time, especially if you speak non-standard English. So in the future, this will be a very important technology as it becomes more and more accurate and more reliable. However, for some functions, I think using voice inputs probably not as good as using a graphical user interface or another system. Uh, if you think about editing a complex spreadsheet, for example, it's just easier to do it with a mouse and a keyboard than it is to actually speak a series commands to the computer. 
So that's all we're going to do today. It's just really knowing about the kernel, which is the core of your operating system, and knowing about the different user interfaces. So you've got to know about your command line interface, you've got to know about your menu-based interface, and you've got to know about your graphical user interface and be able to compare and contrast these together. You've also got to know about this new form of interacting with the computer that we often call natural language voice input or voice recognition, which can be very natural, but is maybe still developing and is not always accurate. I'll see you all in the next lesson. Good luck with your studies.